Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Today we're going to be recounting our nine scariest boondocking experiences and answering the question, is boondocking safe? So before we dive into our scariest boondocking experiences, we first wanted to talk a little bit about what is boondocking. Well, boondocking is generally camping without hookups or dry camping. It's typically or can be done in a non-standard campsite. Frequently very remote, and it's really one of our favorite ways to camp. But you can sometimes find yourself in some sketchy locations. We've been traveling in our RV for five years and have been to hundreds of boondocking sites across the country. Some of them have been a little bit sketchy, so we're going to be counting down from nine to number one, our scariest experience on the road. Number nine, boondocking in high winds. High winds are our least favorite RV weather, and we were once camped on top of a hill on some friend's property when wind gusts came up 60 to 80 miles per hour. The RV started to rock side to side, and we were starting to get freaked out that we might tip over. We went outside and found out the RV was pressing its jacks into the ground on one side and starting to lean. I don't know about what you guys, but one of my biggest RV nightmares, like literally when I'm sleeping, is the RV tipping over. In this situation, we had to hook the truck up to the RV and point it into the wind. One of the first things most RVers do in high winds is close up the slides to minimize the profile. Hooked up, pointed into the wind, we were able to weather the night. But regardless, it was absolutely terrifying just that feeling that you might tip over in the middle of the night. The good thing was that we were boondocking and not in a campsite that fixed our orientation, so we were able to maneuver the RV into the wind. So in that case, the location was bad, but the boondocking was actually kind of good. Number eight, a case of mistaken identity. We were boondocking in the Beaverhead Deer Lodge National Forest, and we had this gorgeous forested site. Night fell, and we were going to let the dogs out, and they're really good at staying close, so we usually just let them out when we're boondocking on National Forest. And this time, though, when we opened the door, the dogs started growling and snarling. This and is not something that no. they do. These are really sweet pups. <laughs> So we were like really freaked out and then we could hear like this rustling and this like movement outside like there was something really big out there. And we grabbed the flashlight and shined it out the door and right as we did the dogs ran outside ah! and we freaked out. Our flashlight came up and we saw a whole bunch of eyes staring back at us and it turned out to be a herd of cows. Uh. <laughs> so this can happen a lot when you're boondocking on national forest land uh, or BLM land. A lot of it is open range and there are some free range cattle. So they might come right up to your RV and uh, they can sneak up on you and give you a little, little start. <laughs> and when they're completely black in the dark of night, you really can't see those suckers. Not at all. Number seven, the weird houseboat neighbor. You've got this one. We were boondocking near Hungry Horse Reservoir in Montana. We had arrived at one of the most beautiful boondocking sites that we had been at yet. We got set up and had an incredible view, but we had some very strange neighbors that we kind of overlooked initially. They were living in a houseboat that they had pulled up on the shore and it was a very makeshift-like thing. Once we closed up and headed to bed, we started to hear noises coming from that direction. Big, loud banging that would echo through the valley. And then a whole bunch of screaming coming from this area. We were really freaked out. We locked all the doors and windows and pretty much just shut ourselves in for the night. We didn't sleep real well, but we survived the night. And in the morning, I braved up and walked over to take a closer look at what was going on. And it turns out that this was a completely homemade houseboat with welded 55 gallon drums as the flotation. And the problem was their boat was sinking, so they had dragged it up on the shore. Those drums expanded and contracted with the day's heat. And at night, they were cooling and crunching in and making all kinds of a racket. The people in it also apologized that they had had a really nasty fight that night and that we might have heard something. Number six, 
So the scariest event that has happened most recently while we were boondocking was actually when we were in New Zealand. In New Zealand, boondocking is also known as freedom camping and it's very widely accepted and there are car parks everywhere that you can stay in overnight, which is really great for traveling that country. There was one time, however, where we stopped at a car park and as Tom was getting in the shower and I was just hanging out in the RV and we were just relaxing for the evening, all of a sudden there was squealing and shouting out right outside our door, it felt like. And it really freaked me out because, I mean, we didn't have anything and we just had the thin wall of the RV to protect us from these people who were shouting profanities and uh, screaming at us and all the other campers there. It was right around the time of the coronavirus pandemic kind of being declared. So they were shouting things like, you campers, you brought the virus here. And they were doing donuts really close to the RVs and just making a lot of racket, making us very, very nervous. We were about to call the police, but luckily they left before we did that. And that was the only issue we had our entire time in New Zealand, which otherwise was an amazing experience. And we have more videos coming on that soon. Thank you. So our fifth scariest boondocking situation occurred up in the Yukon of Canada on the remote Canole Road. We were hundreds of miles from the nearest place that could help us out if anything bad happened, but we weren't really worried about it going into it. We were, we felt pretty prepared. Because we were all alone. We were all alone. It was just us and nature. But as we were going to bed in this beautiful campsite along Quiet Lake in the Yukon, we started to hear some rustling and clanking and noises coming from underneath our truck. Long story short, and you can watch the full story over on Go North Episode 9, there was a porcupine underneath our truck. Actually, not just one, but two porcupines under our truck. Chewing on everything. everything. We had to get up, it was already midnight, and we were going outside to bang on the truck and try to scare these critters out from underneath the truck. They were relentless, so we ended up actually having to move sites. As we were leaving, things went from bad to worse because the check engine light came on and the porcupines had clearly done some damage. You're gonna have to find out what happens, however, in episode nine of Go North. Our fourth scariest boondocking experience was the Idaho Falls drug deals, also known as the story of how we met Kyle and Olivia of Drive and Environment. Kyle and Olivia were traveling in their fiber stream, a little fiberglass camper that they first had, and they randomly pulled up next to us at a boondocking site just outside Idaho Falls, a beautiful spot right on the Snake River. We were staying there with some other friends and we were so excited to meet them and it actually turned out great that we had strength in numbers because that night after the sun went down there was some suspicious activity going on in that park. There were cars that would come up and stop really close to us. They'd hang out and they'd flick their lights a couple times and it was really shady. We had radios between the RVs and maybe we were hyping it up a little bit more than uh, we should have. We probably were freaking ourselves out. But yeah, we were texting with Kyle, Olivia and texting with Robert and Crystal, our other friends. And fortunately we all, we all were safe and we all were watching out for each other, which is which was a great thing, but uh, we, we all made it through the night, no harm done. <laughs> We've since learned that that park is no longer a free boondocking site, probably for obvious reasons. Number three, bombs in the night. Ugh. Tom dragged me to Slab City, California. Slab City is a interesting homeless campsite slash free city slash desert dwelling community in Southern California near the Salton Sea that is well known for its artistic community and basically junk art in the desert. We got there during the day and we started exploring the art of the area, which some of it was pretty unique and kind of cool. I will cool. give it that. 
There was definitely kind of a homeless vibe and trash all over the place in certain areas. So it was kind of uh, pros and cons. But we pulled into this area that was kind of designated for like Slab City newbies, kind of more flat, uh, a little bit more spacious. And we pulled in there and I just had this weird vibe. Caitlin really wasn't digging it, especially as night started to fall. As it got dark, we started to hear gunfire in the distance, and then we started seeing tracer rounds getting shot up into the air by big, probably 50 caliber machine guns. We couldn't see where it was coming from. The dogs were freaking out because they could hear all the gunshots. I was freaking out because like, where did you bring me? And then helicopters started to arrive and they started shooting into the desert. We could see tracer fires and helicopter noise. And then bombs started going off. No joke. Jets were flying in and dropping bombs. There was machine gun, helicopters, tracer rounds. It was terrifying. We felt like we had been transported into a war-torn country. Turns out, Slab City is right next to the Chocolate Mountain Gunnery Range. This is a military facility where they practice weaponry. And Slab City is literally on the fence line. So you get to hear and see all this stuff while you stay. Funny that none of the reviews had mentioned that, that I read. As interesting as it was for Tom more so to watch, we were pretty ready to move on. We're getting down to the worst ones. We're down to number two, getting our bikes stolen in Oregon. We were traveling down the Oregon coast on Highway 1, which is beautiful by the way, and we stopped in Coos Bay. It was dumping rain and our next potential stop was about an hour down the road and we were tired. The place kind of gave us the creeps. We were parked on the side of the road real near the ocean in kind of a local park-ish area. But against our better judgment, we decided to stay the night anyway. It was dumping rain and windy and the waves were crashing right next to the road. Uh, we, we couldn't hear anything around us, just kind of like this roar from the weather. So we went to bed that night and just slept through the storm. And we got up in the morning and realized that something was missing. Our bikes were gone off the back of our RV, meaning somebody had come, cut the cable lock, and stolen our bikes as we were sleeping only 20-some feet away. Yeah, and our dogs didn't hear anything, we didn't hear anything, there was no clue except them being gone the next day. It was a horrible, sinking feeling. We felt so violated and we just had completely lost trust in humanity. Fortunately, some of the townspeople rallied and helped us find one of the bikes, which was awesome. That just really taught us to trust our gut in those types of situations. Like don't boondock in a place where you don't feel safe. And we've tried to follow that ever since. All right, our number one scary experience we've had on the road. And this was in our first year on the road. We were down in Florida looking for a place to stay. And we had been told by a friend of a friend of someone we had met on the road that we could stay with this guy. And again, beyond our better judgment, we checked it out. So we gave the guy a call and he sounded fine on the phone. Uh, we arranged a time to arrive and the first red flag was that this place was completely fenced in and he had to come out and unlock this chain and get his dogs corralled to let us in. And as soon as we pulled in, he then locked that gate with this big old chain behind us. We were locked in second red flag. So Caitlin wasn't too keen on staying at this point and she turned and said, should we leave? And I said, well, I hope so, but we gotta get turned around first. It was kind of a small yard, it was Florida. There wasn't any grass, it was just sand. So we had to do this like million point turn and jackknife the trailer to get turned around in this yard between the building and the fence. And while we were doing that, the trailer sank down to its axles in the sand. We couldn't move an inch. We were completely stuck. So here we were locked into this compound with our trailer stuck. 
and it was really scary, but we had to go back up to this guy and be like, hey, we got our trailer stuck, can you help us get it out? And we weren't sure if he was going to. But he did bring his truck over and we hooked it up with a chain. We were able to uh, detach, kind of fill the holes in and get ourselves unstuck. And at this point, we kind of felt like, well, maybe we should stick around since the guy helped us out. Maybe we could, you know, show him, I don't know, help yeah, him maybe, with maybe this isn't so as freaky as we think. So we were settling in and... Uh, and he's like, yeah, uh, just, you know, be careful of the dogs. I let my dogs roam around. His guard dogs. His guard dogs. And I say, wait, we've got two dogs. Will they be okay? He said, my dogs eat other dogs. Completely deadpan, no humor. Just my dogs eat other dogs. So we didn't know what to do, but we ended up spending the night avoiding the dogs the best we could. And I don't think we slept pretty much at all that night. We were afraid this guy was gonna murder us. <laughs> yes, it was total murder vibes. In the morning, we are like so ready to go. We bring in the slides, we're, we're getting everything ready. And I realize Tom's gone. Like I was inside closing up and, and sweeping and getting everything ready. I go back outside and Tom is gone. I <laughs> talked myself down and I went looking for him and I did find him. He was in one of the creepy outbuildings in this compound talking with the guy and his wife about her sewing and I was doing a little electrical oh assistance gosh. for him but she was absolutely losing I was absolutely it absolutely losing it regardless we got back in the truck and drove away as fast as we could thereafter and we, and we do not stay in people's yards where we are completely locked in that is a level of paranoia that nobody needs to go through <laughs> So while those are some of our worst and scariest experiences boondocking, it's still truthfully our favorite way to camp and we spend most of our time boondocking off grid. We learned a lot from these scary experiences and hope that you guys also learn from them. Uh, just really to trust our gut if we're boondocking in a place that we don't feel safe, we now move on, we find something else or pay for that campground. Uh, boondocking and free camping is kind of, you know, a game that where where can we find a cool spot where it's free and that's awesome. But at the end of the day, if you feel safer in a campground, which sometimes that's just what you got to do, definitely go for the campground. It's it's much better than having your bike stolen or not sleeping at night because you're worried you're going to get in in a sticky situation. One of the biggest things that I can recommend for boondocking is just be as prepared as possible. Have tools with you, and if you feel unsafe, uh, just think about what you can do. We like to keep a can of bear spray hanging by the door, and we also carry with us the Pepperball Life Light Launcher. You can check out the blog listed below for more information, and thank you so much for watching. All right, safe travels, everyone. Bye. Bye.